Grab a drink, grab a snack. This one's gonna be a lot. Atlanta gave me a Woods 2.0 and I'm here for it. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. I hope you're all well. As you can tell, today we're gonna talk about Atlanta season three, episode eight. It's called New Jazz. I don't know why. I also don't know why they called Paperboy that. So if you know, let a girl know down below. Also, before we get into it, most of you already know I'm legally blind, so sometimes I don't see things. So if there's something I miss, also let me know in the comment section and let's go. So this episode opens up with Al and Darius at a restaurant doing the bait and switch about paying the bills. I was not here for this. You know, Darius is my favorite character, but from now on, I'm gonna call him Dusty Darius because that was the energy he was giving. So disappointed. How are you gonna pretend like you're gonna split, then flip, switch, nope, not having it. Earn comes, says, is this for the thing we're not supposed to talk about? I'm wondering, what is that thing? Is Was it this episode or something else? Did I miss something? Whatever it is questionable he leaves that's when Al and Darius decide to go on a Darius adventure I'm just realizing we're on episode eight and this is the second time someone's actually followed Darius the last time was all the way at episode two when Van decided to listen to Darius and go to that place and we saw how that one unfolded so they're walking as they're going to this Nepalese cafe or cafe that has Nepalese honey infused weed that's out of this world we pass by someone crouched over with a weird hat. Darius says, that's a tourist. Don't end up like that. Now, I saw that one way at the beginning of the episode, and this episode blew my mind at the ending with the way they flipped it. Initially, I was like, be careful what you say. Be careful what you say, because you never know where you might end up, right? But then I was also like, this is really weird. Because what, what kind of thing are you getting into that you end up like that? So they get there and the barista says, your friend's been to the other side. I don't know about you. You're going to be all right. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm cool. He puffs up his chest. I love how Darius is pretending like he has enough quarters to pay. He doesn't. So he's like, I'm going to wait on fate, fate, fate. Then paper was, get out of the way. I'll pay. Thanks, fate. How are you going to call your friend fate? That's what I'm saying. Dusty Darius. This is not the energy I want him to give. This had me thinking. All this time that I was looking at socks as a problem, how far removed is Darius? Remember in episode two, I said, why is Van here? I'm kind of wondering the same thing about Darius. We know why Ern is there, he's the manager. Is Darius there to remind Al about home, to be comedic relief, to be that friend he needs? I don't know. The guy puts the tiniest bit of whatever was in that canister into the cup. Paperboy wants to sip real quick. Darius says, chill on that. Let the center melt. Whatever happens, know that I love you. I said, Darius is being so extra. It's not going to be that serious. But then again, it's Atlanta. I didn't realize how telling that line would be for the entire series. They start to walk. They say they're going on a stroll to go to the spa to really enjoy the high. I think Darius asked him several times, are you high? And he says, no. And I was like, no, you're high. You've been high. It's almost as if he turns that corner and that's when it hits. It's like a drop, but it was very subtle. Not like an EDM drop, but a more subtle coming to awareness, self-actualization. He sees these people in love over the bridge. And I'm wondering, does Paperboy desire this? Who is Alfred, you know? We never get to know. The only thing we knew after three years about his love life was that he loved someone named Rosie. And that's because Wiley let them know. Otherwise, how would we ever gotten to know that side of paperboard anyway because atlanta is really about those quick jump cuts we see a white rat on the floor and i say hey it's socks okay i don't really know what that symbolized but that's what that was giving darius goes down a street and alfred's like they're tourists here why is darius ignoring him and going back the opposite way and he disappears then you see a clan of four or five boys rambunctious with themselves appear in the distance while a chick is taking a picture of paperboy this moment was mirror image for me Usually when we tourists go somewhere like Amsterdam, we're photographing. So is she photographing him because like they said, there's not that many black people in Amsterdam or because he's Paperboy, which one is it? And does it really matter? What does matter is these boys try to roll up on Paperboy. This is why I call this episode Woods 2.0. That happened. Season two, episode eight. That's how we got chased into the woods. He's definitely dealing with some PTSD as he's going through this trip, because why else would that happen? He runs into a building safely, able to see, because he kept the door ajar. These kids run up on some woman, take the baby, snatch it and throw it. Why am I laughing hard at this moment? 
I feel so guilty for laughing at this. This is the same thing that Issa did in Insecure. Why do I find it so funny? Because <laughs> it's so ridiculous, I guess. Anyways, now we hear someone crying and I said, oh my gosh, no more horror cuts. I'm so over it. You guys don't understand. I don't do horror. So when he goes up on her, I'm like, this could go way left real quick. She's making weird facial expressions and I'm thinking, is the captor right there? No, no, she's part of an exhibit. She's an art installation weeping for what? I don't know. Maybe it represents the performative art of apology. I don't know. Whatever it was was bizarre. He exits that room, enters another, and it's more of a typical aesthetic museum vibe. There we meet a interesting character by the name of Lorraine. She's got her loose sweater dress thing going on with the fishnets. As soon as I saw Lorraine, I said, I know what they're gonna do with this character. Lorraine is so similar to Paperboy, but so opposite, it's insane. Here you have this character that's unapologetic, that wherever she goes, she's her. She can't really hide from her identity and that's what makes her stand out. Those are a lot of similarities that Paperboy has. But in different ways, she's very abrasive and blunt to the truth. We haven't really seen Paperboy do that other than when they were at the old man's house. When he says, you know, you gotta run game two. Here goes homegirl, reading him for the filth. I said, how does she feel so comfortable being like, oh, you were a rapper? She doesn't know who he is, but he's got the aesthetic. That also plays on the part that a lot of my friends say when they go overseas, they're automatically assumed to be a rapper. It's like if you're black and you're somewhere with money or you look like you have money, you're a rapper. There's nothing else. You can't be an entrepreneur or an engineer, you're a rapper. And I thought that was very funny. He is a rapper, but it kind of played on that sentiment. They go back and forth. She's like, you need to lose the hat. I love how the first thing she says to him is that hat is for women, basically. And I say, like, what? You know about gender fluidity, let fashion be fashion. I mean, I never thought I would see him wear a hat like that, but he was pulling it off, I would say, better than the one she was trying to give him. It's funny how there's this saying of putting on different hats, the way, you know, if you're a mom, you're gonna put on a different hat to be in the corporate world, or if you're an uncle, you're gonna put on a different hat to be a business person, whatever it may be, we wear different hats every day. So I thought that was a figurative way as he's shifting his hat. He's not taking it off, but he's playing and toying with the thought of what would it be like to blend in, to be somebody else. And he eventually succumbs and switches hats. I wouldn't have done that. That hat was not a look. He should have kept the old hat, but for reasons to blend in, to go on this adventure. He switches into that ugly hat. They exit, it's night. One thing that Atlanta does so well is they pair fact with fiction. It is true that the days may be shorter in Amsterdam, depending on what time of the year it is. I never knew that. It wasn't until my friend who lives in Sweden told me they have 23 hours of dark one day a year. I said, I'm never visiting you that time of year. I didn't realize there's parts in the planet that experience quick, quick dark and long days of light. So it could have either been that, hey, it got darker here earlier because it's that time of year, or you're in a state of flow, you're meditative, you're self-reflective, time is passing, you didn't even realize. Whichever one it is, suppose it doesn't matter, right? Before we get further on the plot, I just wanna add this little tidbit in and see if it relates to you as well. I remember when I went to Paris a couple of years ago, I was deciding between going to Brussels or Amsterdam. We ended up going to Brussels, but then fast forward a few years later, I was in Marrakesh and I met a Dutch couple and they're like, you should have gone to Amsterdam, it's beautiful there. And I said, well, my friend and I, who I went to Paris with, was with me in Marrakesh. We both said we preferred Brussels because we don't smoke weed and I don't need the red light district and needed this he. And they said, no, no, that's the misconception. There's so much more to offer there. There's culture, there's just, and I think going into the museum really embodied that Amsterdam to the North American gaze may be one thing, but could be so much more. And that says a lot for tourism, but for life as well. A lot of times we enter into something thinking it's one thing, and then we come to a realization that it's so much more. Back on track, they leave, they're walking down a busy street, and then he loses sight of Lorraine. Now this part was so strange to me and it only made sense at the very end. I'm thinking, boy, you rich, rich. If you haven't dropped yet, you don't feel it. It's dark, call an Uber, go home. You can Uber anywhere, what's the problem? But he's so insistent on following her and calling out her name. It was very childlike. You know when kids get lost in Walmart the way they are? That's what he was giving. And then I got really creeped out because I just had a conversation last week with a friend about the spirituality thing in his home country where they have a thing where if you hear a voice that's calling your name, no matter how familiar it is, if you can't see the person, you don't follow. The reason why is because spirits apparently will take you out and enter your body. 
Now, maybe that's not what this episode was giving, but I just think it's so creepy that I just talked about this last week. We don't see Lorraine, but she's calling him kind of like a dream, but also someone familiar and he's chasing. It was just weird. It's just weird. I don't like it. Lorraine pops back up. Al's and my heart rate can go back down. And she's got a new outfit on. I said, okay, girl, pull off your sweater dress. She goes downstairs. We meet up two other friends whose names I don't think we got, but they call him New Jazz to come in because I guess you can't just bring anyone into the secret speakeasy. They get to the snoozy speakeasy. They have a seat. Everyone orders a drink. He orders a white henny, which I didn't even know exists. And they call her Chris Evans. I said, what? You know, Atlanta's always dropping little things. So I try to research what's to do with Chris Evans. All I found was that he was a brand ambassador for Scotch whiskey and that he DM'd or replied to Lizzo DMing him, which may allude to them saying something about Lizzo in that scene. But other than that, I really didn't take anything away. So I'm like, maybe it's not that important. When Lorraine disappears, they start to ask, what's the relation? And he says, none. They're insinuating there's something else going on. He's not having it. I thought it was funny when they said that her apartment's like 106 in Park. Whether you look at it as like, yeah, she's running through these rappers. And I love how they say she's discreet. That really plays on the theme that a lot of rappers are messing with transgender women. And we hear about that when it comes to Bobby Valentino or Benzino, allegedly. And there's several other names that pop up. But this idea of being yourself and where can you be yourself comes up. But also, 106 in Park, I love that show. But in that way, is that a transaction in the same sense where you're going somewhere to get exposure and a benefit? But who's really benefiting? After that, I'm trying to think. Oh, yeah, he gets up, he goes to the bar, he orders a drink because he wants one real quick. And that's where we meet Liam Nielsen. So they're two for two back to back with the cameos. Last week, Chet Hanks, now Liam Nielsen. Not socks of white Liam Nielsen, the real Liam Nielsen. And I screamed at the screen, like, really? I think Liam Nielsen playing this role was his way of apologizing to the culture, even though his character did not apologize. In fact, he said, white people, we don't have to learn. And I thought that was so hilarious, but also sadly raw and true. So they have a good back and forth. There's so much context in that conversation. And then they start to announce that they have an American performer. And that's when Lorraine reappears which affirms that she's definitely his subconscious because she came back at the perfect timing telling him to exit. And he's apprehensive at first, maybe because of what the friends insinuated back there. But he eventually goes and she says something to him that ticks him off. And he's like, why would I trust you? You've been saying all these things about me all day long. And she comes for him and says, I'm telling you what you need to hear. Why is your family running your business? Who owns your masters? And he's like, what? He's so perplexed. And it really related to your subconscious because sometimes you have that nagging voice in the back of your mind, like a Lorraine, telling you what you need to hear that you may not want to hear. It really tripped me out and I was not here for it. it was when his legs froze and his arm froze and he started falling to the ground. I say, whoa, they did that. They did that. Darius and Al from Christmas Pass Pass. <laughs> and it's like, wow, look how things come full circle. This spaced out Al. Out of body time elapsed, full circle experience. What part was real? When did things begin and end? Acting in this moment was so incredible. The close up of his hands, the falling over. I said, please, paper boy, don't die. Sometimes you have to be lost to be found. This was a trip, but it was more than it. It was figuring out about yourself. It was getting to ask the difficult questions. Who's in your circle? Who's the rat? They're just a lot going on with this episode that I can't even begin to really encapsulate. So I hope you guys help me. My mind was literally blown seeing that because on one level, it's like, don't judge because you never know how someone got to that position. Sometimes you need to be lost to be found, like I said. And more importantly, you need to have these experiences that shift your perspective because we could all be in that place, you know? So the next scene... Al is cozied up. It turns out that Ern took off his clothes. He found him on the street. And just before he's about to leave, Al asks, who owns my masters? Ern says, what? Come again? Pardon? The way he said what? You heard him. You're just buying time to come up with a lie. So when he said, you own it, I don't believe. I don't believe Ern at all. Maybe he's going to figure out the situation in the next episode. But right now, them masters belong to somebody else. And then he also asks, where's Lorraine? And he says, your mom. And I was like, oh. Wow, so that character was the subconscious embodiment of his mother. It all makes sense. That's why he was 
anxiously following her the way a kid would their mom. That's why he had this connection and that's why she was able to call him out. It's just, wow, the way they portrayed and told that story was so multifaceted. This was my favorite episode. The only thing that tops it is the original Woods, but Woods 2.0, new jazz, I'm here for that. I'm gonna watch this again while I'm editing. So if there's anything else I missed that I wanna put in real quick, it'll be in a thought bubble. Just impeccable. This is why I love Atlanta. There were so many themes about insecurity, about perspective, about finding self, about fitting in, standing out, knowing your worth, knowing who's in your circle. It's just wearing different hats. Breakdowns could go on for days and days and days. I just blown away, just blown away. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I did. If you did or didn't, let me know either way. Hit the like if you enjoyed this. And until next week, stay blessed, stay safe, stay sane. Love and later.